God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born. In the vapor of your breath, the planets form. And if the stars were made to worship so light, I can see your heart in it. Every burning star signal fire grace And if creation sings your praises so Good morning, Grace Church. He is risen. He is risen. Will you stand with us as we celebrate here this morning? We're so glad that you came to church today. Let's give God all the glory and all the honor that he's due. We sing. Land of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed the sin. Sing silent as he stood accused. Silent as he stood accused. Beaten, marked, and scorned. Bowing to the Father's will, he took a crown. Oh, if you know it, sing it with us. Oh, that rugged cross. And oh, that rugged cross, my salvation. Where your love poured out over me. Now my soul, now my soul cries out. Hallelujah. Praise and honor unto We sing, Son of Heaven. Son of Heaven, God's own Son, to purchase and redeem. And reconcile the very one who nailed him to. Come on, can we raise our hands and raise our voice? We sing. In my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, Hallelujah! Praise. 
Come on. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free. Oh, is. let's celebrate this morning. Now my debt. Now my debt is paid. It is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus let my Jesus. Sunset's free, oh, it's free indeed. Oh, that blood did cross my salvation. Where your love poured out over me, yeah. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah. Praise and We sing. See, the stone is rolled away. Behold, behold the empty tomb. We sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. God be praised. He's risen from. foundation. Thank you, Father, for what you did. Sing this with me, church. In Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights, what heights of love, what depths of one feet. Wow. 
around his body lay light of the world by dark we sing then bursting then bursting forth in glory all said amen thank you Trina. amen good morning grace church happy easter uh, at this time i'd like to excuse all of our kids back to their uh, sunday school teachers and everyone else please turn and welcome someone this morning say good morning All right. Well, good morning, Grace Church. We are so glad you're here today. My name is Liz. I'm the communications director. And I just want to welcome everybody to this beautiful, rainy Easter Sunday. Woo! Um, I would, uh, I'd like to welcome especially anybody who's visiting for the first time today. If you're new to Grace, we're so glad you're here. We would love to meet you. Uh, right outside to the right, we have an information booth. And we would love to give you a gift this morning and tell you more about how to get connected here at Grace Church. Uh, we also have QR codes on the back of each chair if you check those out. Um, that's a one-stop shop, a good way to get connected and find out about our house churches, our ministries, and lots of other things here at Grace, because we want to get you plugged in. I just want to tell you about uh, two exciting things we have happening next Sunday, so we hope you'll come back for them. Um, next Sunday, we have a special newcomer's lunch. This is for anybody who has been attending Grace for a short amount of time. It could have been you've popped in for one week or that you um, have just been coming for a couple of months and maybe haven't got super involved yet. But either way, we would like to invite you to a newcomer's lunch that is 
next Sunday after the third service, after our 1130 service. Um, and if you hang out right after that, right around 1230, we are going to have a lunch for you. And a couple of the pastors and myself will be telling you more about the church and how you can get involved. And we also have a time of question and answer. And it's just really designed for you to learn more about our church and how to get involved here. So Newcomer's Lunch, we hope you will join us for that and tell your friends. Um, also next week, we have a ministry fair. Uh, a lot of people know that we have a lot of ministries here at Grace. We have house church for community, but we also have ministries that are focused on outreach and activities and care and recovery. Um, so we have a bunch of those that we would like to help you learn more about. Next week at Grace, after all of our services, we are going to have tables outside. There is no rain in the forecast. <laughs> and we are going to have um, people standing out and telling you more about all of our different ministries. You can also check out those ministries if you want to preview them at uh, gracesd.com slash ministries. All right. Well, uh, we have an exciting service today. We're going to have baptisms at the end, and it's going to be beautiful. But right now, I'd like you to please turn your attention to the screen. Tim Tebow is a strong Christian. For God so loved the world. The whole world. That Tebow passed for exactly 316 yards. Everyone. Anyone. Believes in him. The Nielsen TV rating audience was exactly 31.6%. Don't tell me to start. I have so many questions. That he gave his one and only son. Who believes in him not life may have eternal life <laughs> a sort of kingdom that a person cannot see unless he is born again born again yes Well, good morning, Grace Church. How are you? You guys endured the rain. You look good. You smell good. You sound good. 8.30 service. You're like extra good for coming early, so well done. Well done. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm so glad you guys are here. Um, we may not know each other, so you could judge me, but I'm going to ask you not to. So don't judge me. But on Valentine's Day of this year, my wife Amy and I took our three daughters out of school so that we could go to Disneyland. I know, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've already lost half of you. I get it. It's fine. It's very controversial intro. I get it. We went up to Anaheim the night before. We stayed in a hotel. We got up early, got coffee. We are walking to Disney at 7 a.m., trying to be there near the rope drop time. And uh, it's, it's like a beautiful day. As we're walking up, my kids are wearing their princess gear. They've got the ears on. I mean, the sun's out. Love is in the air. People are smiling and dancing. It's, it's the whole deal. But as we get closer to the entrance, we notice that you can hear something on a loudspeaker. And you're like, man, what's, what's that? And as you get a little bit closer, you can see a sign near the loudspeaker. And the sign has the Bible verse, John 3.16, on it. And as you get closer, you can hear that the person on the loudspeaking is preaching. And I'm a preacher, and I love that verse. So I'm like, man, I wonder what they're talking about. And as you get closer, you can start to hear that they're not talking about the kind of thing you want to hear over the loudspeaker, but this is one of those fire and brimstone kind of sermons. And this person is telling you that God's judgment is coming, repent you sinners. And it's 7 a.m. and we're walking into the happiest place on earth. And the message <laughs> over the loudspeaker is turn or burn you sinners. Um, and there's a dad walking next to me that I don't know, a stranger pushing his daughter in a stroller. And he says, like in a drive-by, he says to me, no better way to start the morning than someone telling you you're going to hell. As he just, and I, I, I'm like, excuse me, sir, there's more to the story. Come back here. Uh, I actually know that. <laughs> like, but he's gone. It's, it's over. And so John 3.16 is 
one of the most well-known Bible verses in the world. It may be the most memorized verse in the world. It might also be the most misunderstood verse in the world. So I thought this morning on Easter we could take a look at it together. The context is a religious leader who's a little bit weary of engaging with Jesus publicly comes to him at night and has a conversation. And this is the, the verse comes out of that conversation. So if, if you have this memorized, we're going to put it on the screen, but would you just say this with me for old time's sake? John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If you said whosoever, raise your hand. Yeah, you feel it's, got, it's in there, right? King James Version. It's like lodged in. It's just KJV all the way. God so loved is how this starts. This is significant. Uh, theologian A.W. Tozer says the most important thing about a person is what they think about when they think about God. The most important thing about you is what you think of when you think of God. So let's walk through this. God so loved. God in this verse is not an impersonal force. He's not a far off deity uninterested in the affairs of people. God in this verse is doing something and he's not yelling. He's not scorekeeping. He's not disappointed. He's not passive aggressive. He's not withholding love. He's giving love. And he's not just giving regular love. The text says he's so loving. He's not just loving. He's so loving. This is different. You know how like if you're a parent, you love all your kids, but you so love your favorite kid? Like, you know, don't, don't, you know, you know. Love you guys. Love you. So love you. It's different. So loving. When I was at youth camp as a kid, I remember a preacher, I have this like ingrained in my memory, a preacher said, if God loves you so much, if he had a refrigerator, your picture would be on the fridge. And I remember being like, that sounds silly. And as I've gotten older, I'm like, that's really beautiful that God would have his, my picture on his refrigerator because I have pictures that my kids draw on the refrigerator and it's really beautiful. So this God is so loving, this all-powerful God who created the universe and is currently sustaining the universe is so loving. Why? Why is he so loving? I submit to you because it's who he is and it's because it's what we most need. God is so loving because it's who he is and it's what we most need. This may be hard for you, but listen, you and I were created for love and for attachment. Research shows that babies who aren't loved and hugged and kissed and snuggled and given eye contact will actually stop growing. Infants who aren't loved have developmental pauses in their brain. It causes a higher risk of behavioral, emotional, and social problems. You and I were created to be loved, created for secure attachment with the Father. We are on a quest to be loved. Now, some of you, if you're single, you came to church today for Easter, but you also came scoping and hoping for love. Am I right? <laughs> this is a great spot. I got no judgment. Let's just, let's just help you. If you are here looking for love, would you raise your hand real quick? <laughs> Look around. It's a great place. I, re- I highly recommend. I'm not saying be a weirdo, but I'm saying this is a good place. Find someone. I'm joking, Okay. You might call it acceptance, you might call it approval, security, identity, whatever, but it's all a big funnel, and at the bottom is love. Does someone love me? When you post on social media, you're not looking for likes, you're looking for love. When you're in the gym working on the biceps, fellas, don't forget leg day, you know, like, like you're looking for love. When you call your parents, you're seeking love. When you work hard to achieve something, you want love. Love dictates what you do for work. It dictates where you go to college. Some of us have gone back to people who hurt us because we so badly wanted to be loved. We go to great lengths for love. We would do just about anything for love. In 1993, a singer named Meatloaf wrote a song about this. (laughs) Now, the first question is, did Meatloaf not have any friends? They could tell him the band name Meatloaf is the single worst band name in human history. But this is a band named Meatloaf, and he wrote a song called, I Would Do Anything for Love, But I Won't Do That. And to this day, no one knows what's too far for Meatloaf. <laughs> what is the deal breaker? There is a Wikipedia page designated to trying to answer the question. 
There are two big questions in the world. Why am I on this earth? On this, why am I on this earth? And what is it that meatloaf won't do for love? <laughs> if you're younger, you don't know that. I don't want to sing it for you, but Google later and just feel weird watching that music video. So in this text, God is offering us what we most need. But it's not just love, like generic superficial love. It's an intimate love that knows you. The, the, the verse goes on to say, for God so loved who? The world. For God so loved the world. And when the Bible says the world, it doesn't mean the globe physically. It means the great mass of fallen and rebellious humanity who cannot save themselves. The world is the fallen and rebellious humanity. The world is God's enemy. That's me and that's you. From the Garden of Eden, we have failed to trust God. We have fallen short of his standard. We had missed the mark of his design. God gave us ten commandments. And if you were to read them honestly, you will find out, just like me, that you are a ten out of ten commandment breaker. We're sinners. We're imperfect. We struggle. And sometimes this reality can make us feel disqualified from God's so love. Being a pastor, people have said to me over the years, uh, God can't love me. I'm too sinful, I'm too angry, I'm, I've hurt too many people, I've slept with too many people, I struggle with addiction, I'm too far gone, I drink too much, I've stolen things, I'm too unlovable, I did this, I did that, God doesn't love me, God wants to punish me, God wouldn't want me, and he certainly wouldn't so love me. Listen, you know that God knows that about you, right? You know that God knows everything about you, and yet his posture and his action and his heart towards you is so loving, and his love is not like ours. Dane Ortland, in his book, Gentle and Lowly, talking about Jesus, he says, Jesus does not love like us. We love until we are betrayed. Jesus continued to the cross despite betrayal. We love until we're forsaken. Jesus loved through forsakenness. We love up to a limit. Jesus loves to the end. So church, when you think about God, can you believe this, that God knows me? And God still so loves me. God knows me and he still so loves me. But let's say you're here and you're a skeptic. I get it. And you say, Josh, I have my doubts. I don't know about that. Are you sure? Are you sure that God knows me and so loves me? I would say keep reading the text and find that yes, we are sure. Because God so loved the world that he did something. He gave. He so loved you. In your rebellious state that he gave his one and only son. His love is not vague. His love is not random. His love is not a sentimental feeling. It's a love that gives. A love that's willing to pay a cost. His love is self-sacrificial on your behalf. God said through his actions. He said, I see you. I know you. I understand. And we are at odds right now. And I'm going to be the one that makes it right. In the Bible, this message is called the gospel. The gospel is the good news that God loved you in your helpless and rebellious state while you were his enemy. He sacrificed for you. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says it. God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's basically John 3.16 reworded. God didn't wait for you to clean up first. He loved you. He sacrificed for you while you were his enemies. He put himself in your place. And the gospel story is the most beautiful, profound, life-altering message in the world. It's the greatest story ever told. And every story that's any good that we love in this world has an echo of the gospel. The gospel story is everywhere. This is why you and I can hardly hold it together if there's a movie that shows self-sacrificial love because there is something buried in our bones that knows that's what we were created for and knows that that's what we most want. You most want someone who knows you, loves you, and is willing to sacrifice for you. Does anyone know me? Does anyone love me? Does anyone know me and love me enough to sacrifice for me? That's why movies make you cry. And I'm not just talking about rom-coms where they get together in the end. I'm talking about self-sacrificial movies. I brought 11 of them. To show you. So that every one of you by the end can be like, yeah, I cried at that one. So you may hate nine of these, but you won't hate 11. Do you remember this one, Titanic? Self-sacrificial love. 
Can we agree that there's probably room on the door for (laughs) Jack to survive with Rose? This next movie traumatized a generation. It was called Armageddon, where Bruce Willis takes Ben Affleck up to the spot and then exchanges himself for Ben and through the glass says, Ben, take care of my little girl because Ben Affleck is engaged to Bruce Willis's daughter. Then Bruce goes to die. Are you kidding me? I can't even look at the screen right now. <laughs> Everybody dies in Rogue One. You guys seen Rogue One, Star Wars? Everybody dies. Spoiler alert. making it one of the top five Star Wars movies ever made, and I'll fight you on that. (laughs) Tony Stark in Endgame. Do you remember this moment? Yeah, okay, finally. (laughs) He self-sacrificed to defeat Thanos, and then Captain America thinks he's alone, then all of a sudden Black Panther walks through the hole. It's like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? If you're a literary person, do you remember when Dumbledore laid down his life for Harry? Yeah? And Snape did it. Snape, of all people, was slow playing the whole time. Remember when Aslan laid down his life for Edmund in the Chronicles of Narnia? That's cheating because that's C.S. Lewis like really talking about Jesus. <laughs> like that, was, that was like insider info there. This one's more obscure. Do you, do you guys know this movie? It's called John Q. Anybody ever seen John Q? This is a story where Den- if Denzel's in the movie, it's good, right? But his nine-year-old son is desperate for a heart transplant, and he's too low on the list, and their insurance is messed up. So he takes the hospital hostage, and he takes a doctor and says, I'm going to sacrifice myself. Take my heart out and give it to my son. That's John Q. Spoiler alert. If you're from the Generation Z or below, do you remember when this happened and Anna stepped in to give her life for Elsa? <laughs> and you, you cried because that was the gospel? But the most gut-wrenching of them all for me is from a Pixar movie called Inside Out. In Inside Out, the character named Riley has an imaginary friend named Bing Bong. And the emotion joy is going to be lost in the abyss unless they can find their way out. And they get on this cart and Bing Bong and Joy are trying to get out, but they can't make it. So Bing Bong has to jump off the cart so the Joy can make it to the end. And Joy ends up making it and Bing Bong stays in the abyss. And when it happens, it is gut-wrenching. I'm watching with my kids and I'm sobbing. And they're like, Dad, why are you crying? And I'm like, Bing Bong goes to the abyss so that Riley can have Joy. Bing Bong is Jesus. Like... The best stories echo the gospel. They resonate with us so deeply. Everyone is moved by these because they're moved by the gospel. We want to be sacrificed for. John 3.16 has every right to be on a sign out in front of Disney because it's the best news in the world. Actually, Disney owes John 3.16 copyright infringement. Every one of the stories are telling the story. That God loves you enough to sacrifice for you. His one and only son. There was only one who could do it, and he was willing to do it. But this begs the question, what was the sacrifice for? Why did we need to be sacrificed for? Well, let's keep reading. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes should not perish but have eternal life. The sacrifice was so that you and I would believe That we would believe he loves us and we would be saved from perishing. It's the clearest thing in the text. If you have done this for me, why did you do it? I did it so that you would believe in me and that you would be saved from perishing. But this is the hard part. That God loves you enough to send Jesus. He loves you enough to sacrifice for you. And he also loves you enough to tell you the truth. And the truth is your sin doesn't make you bad. Your sin makes you dead. And there are only two options. You either perish in that disbelief or you live in belief. There is no third option in this text. It is so simple yet so hard. But it's clear. You believe in Jesus and live eternally or you reject Jesus and perish 
eternally. The invitation is for right now and forever. You either have life in Christ right now and have life in Christ forever, or you reject life in Christ right now and live in the ongoing state of rejection and rebellion. You're either with God now and eternally, or you are without God now and eternally, and the choice is yours. So let me be clear. God is not judging us on some standard of being a good person or a bad person or a kind person or an unkind person. He's judging us solely on our relationship to Jesus. And Nicodemus, the Pharisee in the story, is having a hard time understanding this. He can't quite get what Jesus is saying. He's got so much understanding of the religious law, and maybe that's like you. You have so much understanding of religion in your background and so much confusion. Jesus cuts right to the chase in the conversation. He says, Nicodemus, there's really one requirement to eternal life, and here it is. You must be born again. Born again. That's what it takes. It's, it's as though your first birth and my first birth was into death, And now we need to be born again so that we can truly be alive. This is what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, but because of his great love for us, again, the love thing, because he so loved us, God who is rich in mercy, what did he do? He made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Church, the gospel message is that Jesus didn't come into the world to make bad people good. He came into the world to make dead people alive. We're dead. We need to be made alive. The story of Easter is that the dead can be raised. And there is no better news in the world than that. The story of Easter is that nothing is impossible No one is too far gone. What Christ achieved for the world is ready to be received by us. And that is profound good news. And most people stop at John 3.16 because you you could totally stop right there. But you can miss um, the, the beauty of how Jesus goes about doing this. Like, what's his strategy? If God loved the world so much that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish but have eternal life, you would think, okay, how did God go about getting that out to The world, well, verse 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Condemnation in the Bible is a legal standing. It's a verdict pronounced over you. You're guilty. We've seen the charges against you. You are a commandment breaker before a holy God. You have no right standing. You are guilty. And then the text says, Jesus didn't show up to do that to you. He didn't show up to condemn you. If you went to lunch with Jesus after church today, he wouldn't pull out a list of your sins and say, I'm glad that you have come to lunch today. I have been meaning to talk to you about these things. No, he shows up in this world as a savior who is kind and a king who's willing to stand against your true enemy, which is sin and death and the devil. He is your advocate, not your judge in this text. There's a story in the gospel where this plays out. Uh, Jesus is doing a teaching, and some Pharisees, like Nicodemus, teachers of the law, they, they catch this woman in the act of adultery, which is just incredibly shady in the first place, that these Pharisees are like seeking that out. But they find a woman caught in adultery, and they bring the woman, not the man for whatever reason, but they bring the woman, and they're going to trap Jesus. Because the law of Moses says we can stone this woman for committing adultery. And if, if Jesus says stone her, then he's not gracious. If he says don't stone her, then he doesn't follow the law. So he's totally trapped. They'd throw her down before Jesus. And he just starts writing in the sand. Nobody knows what he's writing. Some people think he was like writing their sins. Nobody knows. He's just like totally not buying the trap. And he finally responds, uh, if any of you are without sin, why don't you throw the first stone? And the the story says that starting with the oldest, the Pharisees drop their rocks and walk away until only Jesus and the adulterous woman are together. They're alone. And Jesus asks her, where are they that condemn you? That word, condemn, where are they that condemn you? And she says, there's no one left except you, Jesus. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Now go and leave your life of sin. 
So in this microcosm, we have the macro story of the gospel that the sinless one, the righteous judge, Jesus, the only one who could rightfully throw stones at her, says, I'm not here to throw stones at you. I'm here to take stones for you. And it's the kindness of the Lord that leads her to leave her life of sin. It's the grace of God that leads her to walk away from these acts evermore. And if you can get that understanding, you can understand the glory of the gospel. That Jesus doesn't want to condemn you. He wants to take condemnation for you. Your sin condemns you, not Jesus. You don't need more shame. You need a healer. You don't need more evidence of your failure. You need a savior. You don't need some guy yelling at you at Disneyland telling you you're going to hell. You need to know if anyone can do anything about the state of our souls. And Jesus says, Jesus says, I can. I can do something about the state of your soul. I can cover you from the condemnation of sin. I can take death for you. I can take hell for you. I can cover you. The law was ready to throw rocks at this woman, and Jesus says, no, 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 I'll cover her, which is basically the biblical story in one phrase. In the Garden of Eden, God covered Adam and Eve after their shame and sin. In the Exodus story, when death was coming for them, the blood of the Lamb covered them, and death passed over. This is the picture that Christ is the once and for all shelter and covering for those who believed, and he calls it being born again, which means those who are born again now stand under the covering of Christ, and condemnation cannot get to you. This is why Paul says in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because if condemnation comes looking for you and says, I have a verdict over their life, instead of finding you, condemnation finds Jesus. And there is no evidence of Jesus ever sinning. The verdict of your life is now the verdict of Jesus' life. That when condemnation comes for you, it finds that the judge has a different verdict. You are no longer guilty, but you are not guilty because of the action of John 3.16. And to talk about this on Easter seems so fitting because the promise of the new birth is now available to the world. What Jesus did physically on Easter is available for us symbolically. And my favorite detail about the resurrection that I will probably talk about for as long as I preach on Easter is that the resurrection happened in a garden. And that Easter is God reversing the curse of the whole world. Because church, where did sin and death enter the world? The Garden of Eden. So where does life enter the world? The garden tomb. Everything that died in the garden of Eden was born again in the garden tomb. Everything that was broken in the garden of Eden was born again in the garden tomb. Everything that was cursed in the garden of Eden was born again in the garden tomb. Everything that lives that, that leaves us dead can be born again in the garden tomb. And the Bible calls resurrected Jesus coming out of the garden tomb the first fruit of new creation. Meaning Jesus has proved that his promise has been fulfilled and he is ushering in a kingdom and you and I can join him in that kingdom if we are born again. How do we get born again? Well, the text tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish and have eternal life. Maybe the best part of that verse is that King James word, whosoever. Church, that means anyone. That means everyone. That means it doesn't matter how dark your past is. It doesn't matter how many struggles you currently have. Jesus is asking whosoever, do you want to be born again? Do you want to die to all the stuff that is killing you right now? Do you want to be made alive? I can do that. The resurrection proves Jesus can give new birth. Believe in him, surrender to him, and he will make you a new creation. In fact, Jesus says he will make all things new. Everything in your life that is dead can be brought back to life. Everything that's broken can be made whole. Everything that's cursed can be reversed because of Easter. I think it's fitting that we celebrate baptism on Easter because this is a picture of new birth. You get in the tub and you, you outwardly show the world 
what happened inwardly in your heart. You symbolically are buried in the water as the old self, and that you are symbolically brought up to raise, to be raised to walk in the newness of life. And you know what baptism is? It's a picture of being born again. It's God's way of saying this shows the world new birth. This shows the world that the old is gone and the new has come. And this is the great offer to us. You don't have to leave today like you came in. If you've trusted Christ, then you are born again. And if you have not trusted Christ, then we have that invitation for you. The water is here. And the liner was leaking, and so the water is a little bit cold, but that's going to be refreshing. (laughs) It's going to really feel like being born again today. (laughs) Slash cold plunged. There will be physical blessings of a cold plunge and spiritual blessings of baptism this morning. Church, God so loves you. I know that's hard to believe. It's hard for me to believe sometimes. But it's not about what you've done. It's what, about, it's what he's done. God so loves you. He so loved you, he gave to you. He so loves you, he doesn't want you dead in your sin, but he wants you born again. And if you're honest with yourself, you, you know you, you could use a restart. If you're here and you're just here because a family member invited you and you're like, I'm going to endure the sermon, then I'm going to go eat burritos later. Like, if you would be willing to just think about the great invitation that Christ offers you, the band's going to come out and sing, and we have like 15 minutes to just engage the Lord, to celebrate baptism, and to experience the life of Christ that is available to all. Church, do you want to be born again? God would so love for you to be born again. God would so love for you to be baptized today. God would so love to set you free from all those things that are holding you down. God would so love to transform you today. And the promise of the resurrection is that he can. You just have to surrender to him. So I want to pray that we would surrender to him this morning and experience the joy of being born again. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for baptism. Thank you for John 3.16. Thank you that you so love us. God, I pray this morning we would respond to your love. We would celebrate our friends, symbolizing being born again. We would celebrate the glory of who you are, and God, your presence would just fall heavy on us over the next few minutes. Father, we love you, and we thank you for all that you've achieved for us. Thank you that we're no longer dead but we're alive in Christ. Pray that we can turn our eyes to you now, turn our hearts to you now, and believe that you so love us. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Josh. All right. Let's begin. Will you stand with me as we sing, church? Thank you. 
stands before the of God. He's worthy. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from
bridge. Is there anyone else? There's a moment here, and if you feel a nudge, any kind of nudge from the Lord, and you know, all right, this is scary, this is nerve-wracking, everyone's looking, um, but Lord, my declaration of what I believe is more important than what I may feel temporarily in this moment. So if you feel that, I'll give you guys a couple more minutes to do so. If not, we'll sing this chorus loudly one last time together, and we'll dismiss. Amen. He is worthy. Can we just sing this together? And if you're contemplating, that's okay. We're going to sing just another minute or two. Sing, he is worthy. You are worthy, Father. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things. Come on. And to you are all things. You deserve the glow. You are. You are worthy of it all. Let's raise our voice. You are worthy of it all. For from, for from you are. And to you. You deserve. Hallelujah. Father, may they remember this day forever. That, Father, aside from what they maybe internally felt, they acted upon your word. Father, they saw the new life with you, and they acted on it. So we thank you, Father, for what you've done in this place today. We thank you for the act of obedience of everyone who was baptized, Lord, and everyone who came today. Will you be blessed as we leave this place? You bless, church. We'll see you guys next week. Have a good one.
Chase down my heart through all of my failure and pride. On a hill you created, the light of the world, abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. We well, you lost your life so I could find it here. And if you left the grave behind you so alive, I can see.
Carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. Yeah, I see. 